Today's presenter, Doug Schaffler, is a research associate in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Penn State. He teaches classes associated with agricultural machinery and off-road power. He also works with the new bio agricultural safety and health team, where his interests have focused on the difference in risks that are associated with biomass production and processing, as opposed to practices for traditional agronomic crops. The webinar he presents today points out what risk considerations a traditional crop farmer will need to take when pursuing a jump into the processing of biomass crops, particularly related to the issue of fire. Welcome, Doug. Thanks, Sarah. I'd like to take a minute here first to introduce the folks on the title slide there. Um, my name, as Sarah mentioned, is Doug Schaffler, and I work here in the Ag Engineering Department at Penn State. Dennis Murphy is the Ag Safety Specialist here at Penn State, and he has also been closely associated with this work. And then we worked with a fellow by the name of Rick Orange, and I'll give him a bit more of an introduction later. The New Bio Project, if you're not familiar with it, has been looking at different biomass crops that are adaptable to the Northeast and three in particular are shown there in the left-hand green column. One is shrub willow, and the bottom two, switchgrass and miscanthus, are both grasses that grow for a year and then are harvested, usually dry and stored and then used sometimes for energy, sometimes for cellulosic ethanol, for other purposes. Our safety and health group is kind of an umbrella over much of this area, and we've, we've focused primarily on the smaller scale production by typical agricultural producers of those biomass crops. Some farmers are interested not just in growing them, but also then in processing them. And that's what brought about this work into um, more looking at the, some of the fire risks associated with, with processing that, that material, both in storage and then also in the processing. So our safety and health goal is to look look at, a, at, at biomass safety from a, from a holistic systems perspective, and we have within that then four objectives. For this particular project, piece of the project, the bottom three were, were incorporated into a, into a short manual that tries to pull together some of the things that somebody who's thinking about processing biomass, in addition to just growing it, into something a more dense product or somehow processing it, but some of the things that they need to think about and some of the regulations that may apply to them when they get into this processing arena and out of just the typical agricultural growing arena. So we've put together this manual. It's about 20 pages, and it um, just tries to pull together those regulations and codes and other things that farmers might not be aware of that are going to apply to them. And then also for the folks who need to do the fire protection, the fire first responders in the fire protection service, what they would need to be considering or thinking about if they find out that someone, someone within their service territory is planning on putting in a biomass facility. This publication is just out. Um, I don't have a publication number for it just yet, but later on we'll get to the, if you'd like to get a copy of it, where you can go to do that. Um, so I mentioned before, we enlisted a fellow by the name of Rick Orange to do much of this work, and he had recently retired from the Harrisburg Area Community College. There he was a fire trainer, um, teaching firefighters techniques. And he has, though, a, a interesting background of experience as a code enforcement officer, um, safety inspector, insurance inspector, but also from the response side as a fire chief and then more lately as a fire instructor. So he has a, a good bit of experience with, with all of those, those things. So this publication tries to take a look at small-scale biomass producers, and that's a relative term, but we're not really looking at the, the size of the plants or facilities that have been put, out, put up in the Midwest, the Poet or the DuPonts or those megawatt generating facilities that are burning biomass, generally corn stover, miscanthus, or switchgrass. Instead, we're looking at farmers who are thinking about getting into processing. So we 
try to consolidate the requirements and the regulations for that, and then we make recommendations how to interact with the local emergency responders, not just once you get things up and running, but also while you're planning on putting a facility in. And then we take a look at the, the needs of the local fire companies and the res first responders um, and try to try to get them at least thinking about what, what what they should be planning for if they do have someone putting in a biomass facility. So this really is looking at, at a farmer or someone who's just saying, hey, I've I'm, I'm got some, some acres, I want to grow some switchgrass, I want to grow some miscanthus, I want to grow some willow. What, what, kinds of, uh, what else applies to me if I really start processing that on my farm? Every industry has some acronyms. A few of the important ones here is one of the first ones, authority having jurisdiction, AHJ. Sometimes it's tough to figure out who it is that has the final word in what it is you want to who has the final regulatory say in what it is you can do, can't do. A couple of the other ones that are on here, there's one called the LEP, the Local Emphasis Program of the EPA. And then there's another one also related to EPA. Sorry, that's the Local Emphasis Program of OSHA. Then there's an SEP, which is the State Emphasis Program of OSHA. We're going to be looking at these four um, blocks within here. This is a look at the table of contents. We're going to be looking at these four areas within here. Building codes are one of the first things that affect um, fire response and fire control within a structure. Usually building codes are through the local township. Um, oftentimes they use the uniform building codes. Another code that comes up quite often are the fire codes. Um, again, oftentimes local, but also state, um, state authorized electrical codes. And then the NFPA standards, many of the codes come from those standards, and many of those standards are helpful to fire companies that are doing pre-planning work or thinking about um, what to do. They, they, a lot of times they're standards that lay out templates for how to go about Thinking about um, thinking about the items that are that are going to be different from things that you've done before, so they oftentimes give you a template for doing that. And the last one on here is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration for OSHA. These can be at either state or local government levels, and it's important to figure out who's who in those things when you're doing this. One of the other things that comes up on farms is the agricultural building exemption. Each state either determines if they're going to do that or not. And also, oftentimes it's not real clear on if you take an agricultural product and then process that further, if that is still a, considered to be a farm enterprise or if that now is more of an industrial enterprise and falls under something outside of farming and outside of agriculture. That's something that has caught some folks in their assumption that if they just take an agricultural product and start processing it, there's no problem and they can do that on their farm. There are others that, and, and then suddenly they find out they're no longer just a farmer. They're now they're a entrepreneur and they have an industrial factory going and they have to meet different, different codes for fire and for buildings and for other, other things. Under OSHA, there is a small farm exemption where 10 or fewer full-time employees um, the assumption is make them exempt from OSHA. But OSHA has something they call a general duty clause. And the general duty clause says that all employees have a expectation of a safe workplace. And a general duty clause can be brought into any place at any time. So there is no true exemption. Generally, they're not inspected, but that doesn't mean that, they, that OSHA cannot come in and, and expect things from that from that farm. Also mentioned here is the um, local emphasis program. And that's something to be aware of. In 2003, which is a number of years ago, but OSHA did have a, a lo local emphasis program, or LEP, that targeted combustible dust. And the reason these LEPs show up 
is because something triggers it. In this case, there were three dust explosions in Pennsylvania within a two-year period. And so it was something they decided need to be cleaned up and investigated, not investigated, but just something where there was a problem and they needed to make sure that folks were aware that this problem existed and they needed to, to take care of it. Obviously, if you're, if you're using biomass, if you're cutting dry grasses and baling them and then they're um, chewing them up somehow and reforming them into pellets or briquettes or something of that sort, there's a fair amount of dust that, that comes up. So this LEP, the targeted dust explosions, would, would also be of interest to biomass producers. OSHA requires some things of a workplace. And because fire and biomass are, um, because fires happen in places with lots of dry material and biomass produces lots of dry material, dust and other, other pieces, um, these fire pieces are very, very important. The first thing that, that shows up under this, this requirement is a written fire prevention plan. And there are a number of things that are required. I've highlighted three of them here. One is housekeeping procedures. Just saying, you need to keep the place tidy. You need to keep walkways open. Um, there are rules about how much dust can can build up in places, and it just makes sense to do those things anyway because those are the ignition sources. And if you can keep those ignition sources away, then you're not going to be having those problems. Another one is where our ignition source is going to be relative to these dry materials. Where are people going to be welding, um, smoking, cutting, etc.? And then how much time does someone spend in a place where hot work is being done, been done welding? How long is someone going to be present to make sure there's no smoldering or no um, fire points to come up later? And then lastly, OSHA is always big on employee training, new, new employees and when things change and how often employees should be trained um, on an ongoing basis also requires a evacuation plan so that employees and people there know <coughs> excuse me how to get out of the building if they need to what routes to use where people should meet so you can account for people who have left the, the facility and lastly for equipment that's running and left running um, some has to be shut down before people leave and who's going to do that and then how are they going to meet up with the other people who have left the area So in addition to the, the planning sorts of things, then there are also um, standards in there about what sort of signage you need, how many doors you need to, to exit the area, and um, making sure those, those doors aren't blocked or locked at all at, an, at any point. And then other things about fire, fire extinguishers, they, they get into fire suppression systems, obviously a better or another alternative or another layer of protection to just fire extinguishers. And then the last thing they talk about is lightning protection. And that's, that's a big consideration for folks who are into um, biomass. And many times, biomass storage at the big plants in the Midwest, um, I believe there are at least there are three facilities. And all three have had lightning strikes ignite piles of their, of their stored biomass, which usually results in a, in a very big fire. So they've all experienced that, and they're now still trying to figure out how they best can protect those, those facilities and those, those stored bales. Top of all this, when all is said and done with OSHA and other regulatory agencies that may, that may have a say in things, an insurance carrier can also add on their own requirements. They may come in, and, and because biomass is a relatively new um, industry, and there aren't many, of the, many facilities of this type operating, Insurance carriers aren't going to have a lot of background or a lot of experience with this. So they may come in and say, well, that's all well and good. You have these things done, but we also expect you to do this. And so they may have additional protections. So make sure that they're involved as you're, as you're going through the initial planning stages of, of, of designing a facility and putting equipment together. I'd like to switch now to the um, needs of the first responders, the fire fire service companies. And just think about some of these questions they come up. For them, this may be a totally new business. 
<clears throat> and not be something they're familiar with at all. And so they need to become familiar with the equipment that's being used, but also the the feedstocks, the grasses, um, how it's being harvested, where it's being stored, what kind of facilities then are going to be used? Is it undercover? Is it out in the air? Are they storing equipment? Are they storing equipment and feedstock together? Are they used square bales, round bales? How are they transported? Are they left for a period of time before they're moved? Are they dry? Are they wet? Just all kinds of different thing, considerations of what the actual facilities are going to be. That also gets into what are the fire loads of those different materials. The material coming in may be fairly fluffy, dry, grass type material, and it may be pressed into pellets that then are put into thousand pound bags. And so what's coming in and what's going out are, are two totally different materials as far as um, control or extinguishment is concerned. Are there other are there other types are there other areas within this new facility that are confined spaces or are they using another hazardous material mixing that with any of the um, grass to make a better product or something of that sort sometimes you know we speak of biomass facilities as just using biomass but oftentimes sawdust or other things are mixed with those materials to make a better pellet or to make a better briquette or to just make the product that the manufacturer is trying to, to come up with are the regulatory um, bodies involved? Do they regulate whatever's going on in this building? If so, perhaps that makes the fire company's uh, part in this easier because already there's someone else who's looking at the regulations and trying to make sure that those are met. And then starting to think about the fire company itself, but do the people within that company have the necessary training or education for things that may arise here? Are there things that are going to happen or may happen at this facility that are very different than that may than may happen at other facilities. And do does our fire company have then the, the necessary equipment and materials to deal with fires? And how does this affect the responder? Are there are there hazards to the responder at this facility that aren't there for other facilities in that in that area? And again, because many of these many of these biomass facilities are going to pop up in rural areas because that's where the materials being being grown it may be that these types of facilities or this size of a facility doesn't exist anywhere else within that fire company service area so it's important for them to to really think about the safety of the responders as well and then the last question here is this thing big enough that we cannot possibly that we aren't going to have the resources to be able to take care of an emergency at this facility. Does this facility somehow have to create its own emergency response system or provide equipment so that it can be protected effectively? And the insurance company is likely to be involved with that question as well. So if you take all those questions, you can put them, pretty much put them down into, break them down into three different units, pre-planning, training, and resources. Take a look at these one by one. So the pre-planning really starts at the, the initial starts with the initial work between the first responder and, and the business itself. And that is the sooner that starts, the better off everything will go from that point. Um, taking a look at the facility as it's under construction, plans even before it's constructed to make sure there's enough room for vehicles and water sources are laid out in a reasonable and accessible way Then take a look at the facility when it's finished so you know where, where things are and then the, the last one there is where one of the NFPA um, standards can help they provide a, a template for for putting together pre-incident plans if this happens you know what are we going to do or if this happens what equipment do we need for this and those sorts of scenarios training then may be I mean, training is ongoing for all firefighters, but perhaps this facility will all of a sudden throw in something that's a little bit different than has been seen at other facilities. Large bales covering a quarter acre or more, depending on the size of the facility, can be a different sort of um, fire source than maybe they've seen in the past. Many times the business will host regular drills for the fire companies involved, and 
That may happen every year, every couple years, every three years, whatever the fire company and the facility itself think would make a good good schedule. But obviously, on a fire company side, people come and go. And on the other side, on the facility side, um, people make improvements, change processes, move things around. And so things may, may change over time. And it's best to be best to know exactly what you're going to be running into if you are show, showing up in an emergency situation. And then the last the last piece here is the resources. Does a fire company have the people it needs, and can get, can they get them there in a timely manner? Um, biomass can be pretty dry, and can once the fire starts, can can spread rapidly and, and get to be a pretty a very hot um, very hot fire in a very short amount of time. And do you have these other other things there? Do you have procedures in place? Do you have the apparatus you need to control or fight subdue the fire? Those kinds of things. One interesting partner in this whole business has been the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Because of the big biomass facilities out in the Midwest, the Oak Ridge National Lab energy folks got involved because not a lot was understood about how hot these fires are, how fast they spread, how far apart should these bale stacks be, be made um, after they had these, after they had a number of fires, they, they really decided that they needed to be doing more research into this. And so the picture on the left there are stacks of square bales, usually corn stover or switchgrass is what they've worked with primarily to this point, but stacked in a way, in a very controlled way. And then there's an ignition source underneath that. They light bales on fire, and then they, they measure the heat and the speed with which the fire um, propagates and spreads, and then they also um, get an idea of how hot the fire will be. And interestingly, they have found that this type of material, the switchgrass bales and the corn stover bales, burn hotter than plastics do. And so that was one thing they didn't expect was just the actual amount of heat that comes off of one of these fires. So they're working with the underwriter's lab on those kinds of testing. And then they're also um, putting together a manual. And this one will be large and will be aimed at the bigger, bigger producers of energy that use a lot of biomass material. And so we'll have lots of biomass material stored. The bottom right picture is of one of the fires out of Nevada, Iowa, at one of those biomass facilities. And they do get, they do, get to be large fires. The best thing that they've decided to do still is to just let the fires burn out. And so they just more protect things around and just let the fires burn out. So again. The information I presented today is condensed from this about 20-page manual. If you were to go to Google and just put in Penn State Extension Publications, um, you can find how to order there. The website is here. And I believe the price on this is about $3, so it's not an expensive publication. But it may help you to give you some ideas on where to get started. If, if you're considering putting in some sort of biomass processing facility, or if you're on the other side of things and are expected to provide fire response to that facility, some of the places to go for information on that and things to be thinking about. And that's what I had put together for today. So thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Um, so uh, to, per to our participants, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat pod. Um, Doug, can you talk a little bit about where you see Obviously, some of these crops are new. Some of the uh, physical layout of these types of processing facilities have really unique considerations that are certainly needed to be taken case by case. But where do you see the best current examples of expertise on these topics? Um, is it with fire companies who are in proximity to primary wood processing facilities? Um, in terms of on-the-ground experience, what types of fire companies in what areas are probably the best situated to um, offer information, uh, uh, practical on-the-ground information about this? And what do you see as the opportunities to spread knowledge between communities of responders among those groups that are particularly well situated based on their experience? That's a good question, Sarah. A number of the pictures that were in in throughout here were taken by a fire company down in southeastern Pennsylvania. And the bales were actually dry hay bales and would burn similarly to switchgrass. 
But there have been some fire companies that have experience with these large bales. The other thing about rural fire companies is sometimes they've had experience with barn fires and with large quantities of hay in the barns. And they know that if you start breaking those bales open, you're exposing the bales to oxygen, and that can create a much bigger, hotter fire quickly. And so oftentimes it's best just to let things lie and burn themselves out rather than stirring things up and creating a bigger fire. As far as expertise for these things, I think probably the best expertise is going to be with the folks who are, are at the Oak Ridge National Lab who are getting together from, from the big um, bigger companies and who have had experience with these lightning strikes in the Midwest that have ignited large chunks of, of their bale storage. I, it's hard to find that right now. I haven't been able to really dig a lot of that up, but some of those folks are willing to talk to people about those sorts of things. Gotcha. Um, are there good lines of communications between uh, communities that tend to respond to the same area between multiple communities to share knowledge like that right now um, in the current model of rural fire fighting? The good answer to that is yes, of course there are, but I think that's going to, that always depends on the area and those companies and how well they communicate. I think I, I know that some areas do very well communicating while others maybe don't do quite as well. Um, so that's not a great answer, but that's, I mean, that's the reality of things. It really depends on the leadership within the fire companies and how well they communicate with the others that they um, use for mutual response. Sure, sure. Um, you mentioned that one of the important uh, means for, for sharing this type of information are those open houses with biomass businesses um, where they, they host regular trainings. How common is that? Um, I know you know of some examples of that. Is the, the impetus to do that really um, driven by the, the business's interest in, in maintaining those positive relationships? Or um, in most of the cases where you see those regular trainings happening with a specific business, is it um, fire companies maintaining an interest in, uh, in keeping up to date? The one that we've been closest with has been the driver for that. They realized early on that what they were putting in was had a lot of flammable material, dry flammable material, and then they were drying it. And in addition to that, they dry the material further before they before they pelletize it. And so they were looking to integrate the fire company into their plans initially to make sure that what they were doing made sense, and also to make sure that as as things were constructed, the fire company was aware of what they were doing and what the hazards were there and what the water sources were and that sort of thing. So they have had regular trainings every couple of years, um, doing one again this April, the end of this month. And I think it's been about three years since they did it last. So they realized that they've made some changes since then. They've numbered buildings. They have done some other things to make fire response a little easier. And they want to make sure that the companies that would be responding are aware of those changes and aware of what's what their process is and where things are within that area. OK, uh, we have a question from a participant. Uh, it seems like the air pollution would be incredible if you had a fire and let it burn itself out. How long might that take? Weeks? Months? Well, that has been, in these fires that have occurred out in the Midwest, it's been weeks to months for some of those fires to, to go all the way out, and yes, the neighbors are not happy about it at all, um, and that is one of the that is one of the big concerns now, when we're looking at these fires and looking at that. In the past, though, what they found was they were stacking things, they were putting big, big piles of biomass right near another big pile. So if one pile caught, then another one would catch, and it was kind of like a domino effect. And so now they're they're really they're making a big effort to make sure that they're spacing things far enough apart that they can keep one fire from spreading to from one pile to another pile or to another area. And also rethinking how much they want to have in a given area. Maybe they want to keep it more, keep the biomass more at the field where it's originally harvested for a longer period of time and not consolidate it so much at the plant. So there are different things that are being considered to, yeah, just, just for that, to make the neighbors a little bit happier if a fire does occur. 
because it's scary enough to have a big fire going right near you. Um, not to mention, as you say, the amount of smoke that comes off of that. So speaking of those infield decisions that are made um, when you're keeping stuff in the field and, and storing it there semi-long term, in wildland firefighting, you know, we talk a lot about <clears throat> sort of the minimum distance of uh, removed fuels, so bare mineral soil, based on um, the height of vegetation, what's there, you know, a lot of factors go into that. And certainly it's different case by case. Did, um, did your work or the Oak Ridge National Labs work come up with a sort of recommended uh, minimum safe distance between bale piles uh, according to how dense those piles were, how tall it was stacked, et cetera? That's, right now there's a University of Iowa publication of, because that's where a lot of these corn stover stacks are that says 85 feet. But I haven't been able to find or get an answer from them as to where that number came from. I'm sure it's based on something, but that is one of the big questions that the Oak Ridge National Lab really wants to answer with the research they're doing. Just come up with a, a research-based answer to that question, not just can you get a fire truck between piles, but how much heat does a pile generate and how far does the next pile need to be away from that so it doesn't cross. Since you mentioned the Midwest again, you touched on the importance of lightning protection. What are a couple of the best practices to keep in mind when you're thinking about that? Um, for lightning protection, the two big things that the NFPA suggests are to make sure that the installation or the, the planning and the installation are done by somebody who's authorized to do it. So somebody who knows how to protect things with lightning protect, protection. It's not a do-it-yourself sort of operation. It's something that other folks really need to be involved with. Gotcha. Um, I have one more question, then I'll, I'm going to kick it back to uh, the participant uh, questions that have been raised. Um, this may be a little bit outside of, of your your central research focus, and that's fine. If so, just uh, we can move on. But some of the growers that we've worked with ask a lot about prescribed burning in, in grass crops. Certainly in some of the prairie plantings that are done in the Midwest, um, there are routine prescribed burns on those sites. Um, but, you know, we've even seen some prescribed burning done in switchgrass plantings in Pennsylvania. So um, do you have any thoughts on that? Obviously, it's a whole different can of worms than the, uh, the processing and storage issues that relate to fire risk. Um, but uh, have you looked at that at all? Do you have any thoughts there? I haven't looked at that at all. But when I've seen that, what it's brought to mind is out in uh, Washington, in the Palouse, where they grow a lot of wheat, they still burn some of that ground every few years and that's a very it's an interestingly regulated thing now where it, they're they're allowed certain days certain temperatures certain winds certain whatevers and they can only burn on a certain day and it just makes it a very complicated procedure anymore but I have been one I, I do not know anything more than that about it though fair enough yeah so you know certainly like you said it's it's pretty well regulated. There are a lot of insurance requir requirements. I think in, in PA, uh, the Pennsylvania DCNR and the Nature Conservancy are two of the really big leaders when it comes to coming up with prescribed burn plans and, and things like that. But but yes, certainly, certainly um, a lot of planning and regulation that goes into that as well. Um, all right, so our, our final question comes from, from Sue. She asks, if you could explain again how to find the publication you mentioned, um, would you mind reviewing how to how to locate that? Um, I I know when I looked online the other day, <clears throat> yesterday I couldn't find it either, and I called them and they said it would be getting up there very soon. So I'm not sure how very soon is. I know when I called, I ordered some of the publications, they had it, and they could send it to me. But for some reason, it hasn't made it up on their on their search engine yet, or up into the listing of publications. So I need to get back and contact with them and make sure that it's coming up. Okay, um, when it's up, I will make sure to include it in the description uh, once this recording is archived so that anybody who views this webinar can find it there. And we'll make sure as soon as it's available to link it on the main new bio website, which you can see linked in the chat pod or again in the description um, under the archived presentation recording. So, uh, Doug, that's all the questions I have. I, I think we've kind of kind of run the Q and A dry here. Is are there any last minute thoughts you want to leave us with after your presentation today? Only that 
many times farmers get into things not really realizing that there's more to it than they first thought about. And this is one area where if a farmer is growing some biomass crops and thinks that processing them would be a real neat next step to do, just to really think about it and really investigate all of the regulatory agencies that you may be, um, may be involved with down the road if you get into it. Just really do, do the groundwork before you start, start building something. Good advice for almost anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug, for joining us today. Uh, the recording of this presentation will be posted on our website within the week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining.